Here are some newspaper clippings that illustrate who gets sick. And again, I found that whoever developed illness, whether it's cancer or multiple sclerosis or any of these illnesses, it wasn't accidental. Certain people were disease prone. And in seven years of palliative care work, looking after terminally ill people dying of cancer, I saw the same thing over and over again. So what were the characteristics of these people? How did they stress themselves without knowing it? <clears throat> so the first, uh, these are newspaper clippings from the Globe and Mail. And this is a story written by a woman who's diagnosed with breast cancer. Her name is Donna. Her doctor's name is Harold. And she's married to a guy called Hai. And Hai's first wife died of breast cancer. And now Donna, the second wife, is diagnosed with the same condition. And so she goes to the doctor and she writes in this article, Harold tells me that the lump is small and most assuredly not in my lymph nodes, unlike that of Hai's first wife, whose cancer had spread everywhere by the time they found it. You're not gonna die, he reassures me, but I'm worried about Hai. I wanted the strength to support him, I say. Now, what do you notice about that? Some of you that weren't there last night, what do you notice about that statement? I wanted the strength to support him. Anybody? Yeah, her, her, her immediate thought is on her husband. So her automatic compulsive thought is not, my God, I'm diagnosed with cancer. How will I cope with it? What kind of support do I need? But the automatic thought is, how will I support my husband? The poor guy has already lost his first wife to breast cancer, and I'm diagnosed with it. How will I support him? All the time that I'm receiving chemotherapy and radiation or surgery, how will I support my husband emotionally? So this automatic and compulsive um, concern for the needs of others while ignoring your own, is a major risk factor for illness and stress and burnout for reasons that I will tell you. That's the first. All these others that I will read you are obituaries uh, from the Global Mail. These are stories of people who have died. And what you will notice in those obituaries is that the things that are considered to be so wonderful about these people are also the things that kill them. So he's a doctor who worked in Toronto. Never for a day did he contemplate giving up the work he so loved. He, he was 55, he died of cancer. Never for a day did he contemplate giving up the work he so loved at Toronto Sick Children's Hospital. He carried on with his duties throughout his year-long battle with cancer, stopping only a few days before he died. So I want you to consider that one. If you were diagnosed, or if a friend of yours was diagnosed with cancer, is that what you would say? Is that the thing to do is to go back to work and to keep working every day? And all the time that I'm receiving treatment or you're receiving treatment, chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, whatever is needed, you might be sick and all that, just keep working. And keep working until you die. So this compulsion to identify with the work that you do with the duties that you have, with the responsibilities that you've taken on, rather than the needs of the self, rather than your own needs. That's a big risk factor for illness. It's a big risk factor for burnout, for self-imposed trauma. The next one is a obituary written by a husband about his wife called Naomi, who died at age 55, also of um, cancer. In her entire life, she never got into a fight with anyone. The worst she could say was fooey or something else along those lines. She had no ego. She just blended in with the environment in an unassuming manner. So this inability to express your feelings, the so-called negative feelings, is a major risk factor for illness. So as I mentioned last night, there was a study in the States a few years ago that looked at 1,700 women and uh, what they, over a 10-year period. And women over a 10-year period who were unhappily married and didn't express their emotions 
were four times as likely to die as those women who were unhappily married and did express their emotions. The difference wasn't whether they were happy or not. The difference was, did they actually talk about how they felt? Did they express their anger or their, or their hurt? And the ones who didn't were four times as likely to die. So the suppression of how you feel is a major risk factor for illness. Here's a woman who died of cancer at age 55. This is in Calgary. She, was, she worked for the Calgary Symphony Orchestra. She was a mother of three. A master at multitasking, she juggled several hockey practices. Now I want you to look at your life, okay? A master at multitasking, she juggled several hockey practices, school board, orchestra, and other extracurricular activities. June 2005, brought terrible news to this mother of three, by now president of the Prance Council at Western Canada, Western Canada College. Emergency surgery revealed metastatic cancer. She refused the cloak of illness. She did not give up any of her roles. I get that one. She did not give up any of her roles. It's all about roles. She even continued her 5 a.m. bicycle trips around the nearby reservoir. She enrolled in a life coaching course and upon graduation from the Adler School, she initiated Living Out Loud, a group of women with cancer. All the time that she was having terminal illness. She, she did not stop for a second. So again, it's compulsion to keep working and working and working, even in her spare time. It's a major killer. And the last one uh, I read last night, uh, this is a doctor who died of cancer. Sidney and his mother had an incredibly special relationship, a bond that was apparent in all aspects of their lives until her death. As a married man with young children, Sidney made a point to have dinner with his parents every day, even if his wife Roslyn and their four young kids waited for him at home. Sidney would walk in, greeted by yet another dinner to eat and to enjoy. Never wanted to disappoint either woman in his life, Sidney kept eating two dinners a day for years until gradual weight gain began to raise suspicions. So this poor guy believed two things. He believed that he was totally responsible for everybody felt. So if his mother was upset because he was dinner with, his, dinner with his family, that was his fault. And he also believed that he was never disappoint anybody. So this business of living out to expectations and never disappointing anybody is a killer. In palliative care, I once was looking after a guy who was the president of a shark cartilage company. You may have heard about shark cartilage. It used to be marketed, maybe still is, as a prevention for cancer. So this guy sold shark cartilage. And then he gets diagnosed with cancer, terminal cancer. Uh, he, was, he died within a couple of months of the diagnosis. And his last, he spent his last two or three weeks in the hospital when I was looking after him. And he was still eating the shark cartilage. If you've ever been near this stuff, it smells awful. You could, you could, uh, the stench, you know, you could sense it as soon as you walked in the hall. So I asked him, what does that stuff taste like? He said, it's horrible, I hate it. I said, why do you eat it? He said, well, I, this, is, this is a week before he died. He said, well, I no longer believe that it's going to stop my cancer, but my business partner would be so disappointed if I stopped eating it. And so the, uh, one of the last services that I offered him was that I convinced him that with one week to go in his life, he, did, he was not responsible for whether or not his partner was disappointed. He stopped eating the stuff because he hated it. But this belief that you must not disappoint, whether it's somebody else's expectation or whether it's the high expectation that you impose on yourself. And you all talked about expectation this way. That fear of disappointing is again a major risk factor for illness, for stress and, and burnout. And my contention is very simple. What, what, what characterizes all these people is they don't know how to say no to all these responsibilities that they've taken on. They don't know how to say no. And my contention is when you don't know how to say no, your body will say it for you. And it will say it for you in the form of illness or some kind of a symptom. Now what happens is, 
that when you go to the doctor with a rash or an asthmatic cough or an inflammation, they're going to give you the stress hormone cortisol to treat it. But nobody's going to ask you about the stresses that you have in your life. That conversation doesn't come up. So if you have an inflammation of your joints, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, you go to the doctor and they'll give you anti-inflammatories, but they're not going to ask you, what is your body saying no to? And you're not going to ask yourself either because you don't think of it. And yet that's the most important question. What am I not saying no to? Let me give you an example in terms of rheumatoid arthritis. In rheumatoid arthritis, what happens is that it's called a so-called autoimmune disease. Autoimmune means, auto means self. So in the autoimmune diseases, the immune system, which is designed to protect you, actually turns against you. So in autoimmune illness, the immune system, which is meant to be your self-preservation mechanism, becomes your enemy. So the immune system attacks you so that you make antibodies against yourself. Antibodies are, cel are cells that are, are, um, that are meant to, um, or proteins that are meant to protect you and attack bacteria and attack toxins so that you're safe. But in this case, they attack you. So in, in rheumatoid arthritis, there's a, something called rheumatoid factor, which is an antibody that attacks the joints. It's like as if the Canadian army invaded Canada. It'd be like that. The army that's meant to protect you actually turns against you. Well, in the book I described the case of this young woman called Rachel, who had, this, who had her first rheumatoid arthritis attack on the uh, evening of Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is a Jewish New Year. It comes in uh, September, usually. And it's a holy day and a holiday. Uh, sort of like on a level of Christmas, you might say, although it's a different holiday, but it's a family meal, among other things. And so Rachel, this young woman, was at her mother's place preparing dinner for the family for Rosh Hashanah. And she was working really, really fast because she had to finish by 5 o'clock. Because after 5 o'clock, her brother was going to arrive with his family and he didn't like Rachel. And he didn't want her there. So Rachel was working hard to finish this dinner in time so she could leave before the brother arrives. So there wouldn't be any unpleasantness. So when she's telling me the story, I asked her the obvious question. I said, but just a minute, are you telling me that um, you're preparing dinner that you're not going to take part in? Why? She says, well, because the family has to be together for Rosh Hashanah, don't they? Now, what is the implication there? That she's not part of the family. She never finished the meal. Her body said no. Her joints became inflamed severely inflamed, you know, swollen, hot, red, painful. She was rushed to the hospital and was given, guess what, medication? Cortisol, the stress hormone. Her body said, no, you're not doing this anymore. But what was the story? What was the story? The story was that Rachel was a failure before she was born. Now, how can you be a failure before you're born? She was a failure before she was born because she was conceived in a desperate attempt to keep the parents' marriage together. And she failed to do that. They separated by the time she was born. She was a big disappointment right from the beginning. And she never had the sense that she was loved and accepted like the brother was. So she wasn't really part of the family. And how she coped with it was to suppress her needs, to suppress her emotions. You see, if you weren't loved for who you were, then what you're going to do is you're going to work to make yourself lovable. And the way you make yourself lovable is to be of service to everybody else and not to have any needs yourself. And that was, that's how she grew up. That became her second nature second nature, not her first nature. But she, thought she forgot her first nature because her first nature was having, of having needs and having emotions wasn't acceptable to the family the way she perceived it. So she suppressed her first nature and developed a second nature.
to be always be the helper. <clears throat> Until 35 years later, her body said, no, you can't do this anymore. In other words, this is a totally different way of looking at illness. Because all of a sudden, illness is not just an enemy that you have to fight. You always talk about fighting cancer. It's actually, in a strange way, a friend who comes along to teach you something. I'm not saying, therefore, to... I'm not recommending cancer as a way of learning anything, by the way, or, or rheumatoid arthritis. I'm just saying that when it happens, that's its meaning. Now, I don't know. I, as a physician, I certainly had the experience many, many times, actually, of people telling me <clears throat> that this disease... You know what I told you about this firing that I had when I was fired? It's one of the best things that ever happened to me because it taught me a whole lot. Let me read you a quote here by a spiritual teacher. He says, your conflicts, all the difficult things, the problematic situations in your life are not chance or haphazard. They're actually yours. They're specifically yours, designed specifically for you by a part of you that loves you more than anything else. The part of you that loves you more than anything else has created roadblocks to lead you to yourself. You're not going to get the right direction unless there's something pricking you in the side telling you, look here, this way. The part of you that loves you so much that doesn't, it was, doesn't want you to lose the chance, it will go to extreme measures to wake you up. It will make you suffer greatly if you don't listen. What else can it do? That's its purpose. So, boy oh boy, that firing that when I was fired was the best thing that ever happened to me. I learned so much about myself and I ended up doing work I loved in the downtown east side of Vancouver. But that's how I, at the time, of course, I hated it. I didn't perceive it that way. Well, I've been told by people that some disease is the best thing that ever happened to them. And I've even been told that by people who have terminal illness, that it's the best thing that ever happened to them. I don't know, have you had that experience, any of you? When I mean, you've had people tell you that some very terrible thing is the best thing that ever happened to them? Put your hand up if you, if you, if you heard that. Quite, yeah, some of you have, quite a few of you have. So what are people talking about? What people are talking about is that whatever terrible thing happened brought them closer to themselves. It woke them up to reality. Now the question is, why did we lose reality in the first place? How do we suppress our first nature and why do we do it? Well, as in Rachel, how do we develop the style of, of never wanting to disappoint anybody, of always being dutiful, of being responsible for everything, or never saying no? Why do we develop that style and how does that make us sick? Well, we develop that style in childhood because we have no choice in the matter. Now, as I said last night, the human child has two great needs. Really, they're almost equal. The first need is for attachment. Now, attachment means the seeking of closeness and proximity of love, really, with other people. The purpose of attachment is to make sure that little children are taken care of. Because the human child is completely immature, underdeveloped, and utterly dependent, and completely helpless. That feeling of helplessness that some of you talked about today, it's actually a memory of your childhood. Because the only time that you're really totally helpless is when you're a small child. You really are helpless. You know, you're powerless to help yourself. You need help from the outside. And compare us even to a horse. You know, a horse can run the first day of life. We can't do that for a year and a half. So we're born much more immature and much more dependent than any other creature. So therefore, our need to attach, to connect with somebody who will take care of us, is absolutely life essential. Without that, we don't survive. And we need that connection throughout our development. And we need that connection throughout our lives. So all our lives, we want to be attached to other people. We want to be loved. We want to feel loved. We want to be loved. 
that that's a biological drive for attachment. So that's our big need because human beings would not have survived not just their infancy, but as a species who wouldn't have survived because nature was so harsh and threatening and difficult to extract living from that human beings never would have evolved except because they were connected to one another and supported one another. They lived in groups and communities that looked after each the other. This is, this is our nature. This is actually this myth in, uh, in this society that human beings are competitive and aggressive and selfish and individualistic. It's not how it is. We're actually wired to be connected. Even rats are wired to be connected, you know? There's been an experiment done with rats where they, sh if, you, if you want to stress a rat and want to see what stress does to him, what you do is you can um, conduct electricity into the cage so that he gets a shock every time he puts his foot down in the wire cage, he gets electrical shock, then he gets stressed. And then you can measure their stress hormone levels and that way you can study stress. Well, here's an ex interesting experiment they did with rats. They actually shocked rats in their feet with electricity, then measured their stress hormone levels. Then they had these rats watch other rats getting shocked. And the rats' stress hormone levels were higher when they watched other rats being shocked than they were being shocked themselves. So even rats are wired for empathy. Even wire, rats are, 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 are wired to suffer more when they watch other, others suffer them and they suffer themselves. So that's our nature as human beings, so that's how we survive. So we're wired to attach, to be taken care of, to, to take care of others. That's how we're wired. In the case of the child, the child is not wired to take care of others. He or she is programmed to be taken care of because she's so helpless. So we have that need to attach for the sake of survival. And then we have another need. And that other need is for authenticity, to be ourselves. And that means to be in touch with ourselves, to be in touch with our gut feelings, to be in touch with our emotions, and to be able to express them. That's what it means to be authentic. Authentic simply means to know what, who you are here and to be able to express it. Now so many of us lose our capacity or we dull our capacity to be authentic. But that's a big need that we have. Why is authenticity a big need for human beings? Because again, without that we don't survive. At least during evolution we wouldn't have survived because faced with the dangers of nature, you had to be truly in touch with yourself in order to survive. It wasn't so much the thinking that helped us survive, it was being in touch with ourselves. The thinking came along later. I mean, <laughs> think about it. When, when the caveman is sitting outside his lair, um, enjoying the sunset, along comes the saber-toothed tiger. Now the caveman sitting there watching the sunset all of a sudden sees the saber-toothed tiger. If he starts thinking about it, hmm, I wonder, is this tiger friendly or is it hungry? Is he coming towards me to make friends or is he coming to, because he wants to have dinner? By the time he figures it out, he's dinner. He's got to be in touch with his feelings and his feelings are telling him, danger, you better hide. So not being authentic is not to be in touch with ourselves. So that's a big need to be authentic. And you all have that need. We all have that need. And when we don't retain our connection with our authenticity, we suffer. And you all know this. So why do we give it up? We give it up if we have to. And why do we have to? Because some, in this society, in this society particularly. We have to give up our authenticity very often to maintain our attachments so that 
if a child is sad, but the parents can't handle sadness because it threatens them too much, then the child will suppress the sadness and be always be cheerful and nice. We're supposed to be happy. Well, if you're supposed to be happy in order to be accepted by your parents, then you will suppress your sadness and you won't be in touch with it. You're always one of these cheerful, nice people who get cancer 50 years later. If your parents can't handle anger, let's say your mother and father were come from homes where there was a lot of rage. So the emotion of anger is, is very threatening to them. So when a one and a half year old child gets angry about something, the parents feel threatened. Oh, little, good little boys don't get angry. Then the child will suppress the anger, not deliberately, it's not a conscious decision. The brain will do it as a way of making you fit in with your environment. So that the suppression of the self, the suppression of the authentic self then, is actually <clears throat> your co coping mechanism to survive in that particular environment. Because in order to survive, you have to stay connected to the parent. So if your parents can't handle your emotions, you'll suppress your emotions in order to maintain your attachments. So that's what happens, is that in the battle between <clears throat> authenticity and attachment, attachment wins every time. And then becomes programmed into you. So then 25 years later, your friends want to do something that you don't want to do. But if you say you don't want to do it, they're not going to be your friends. And you're still going to say, okay, not consciously, but you're going to say, well, I, I can't lose the attachment, so I'm going to have to go along with what they want. I can't be authentic. I can't express how I feel about it because then I won't be accepted. And then you later on, you, did, you do this thing, whatever they wanted to do. Maybe, maybe, maybe all it is they want to go out drinking on a Saturday night. You didn't feel like that. But you do it anyway because you want to be accepted by them. And then Sunday morning with your hangover, you're wondering, what the heck did I do that for? Well, you did it because you suppressed your authenticity in order to maintain your attachments. And you did that because you were programmed that way as a kid. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's automatic. It's automatic behavior. So I gave the example last night of my visiting my mother in a nursing home when she was about 78 and I was 54 and I had surgery that morning on one of my knees, just minor surgery, so I had a bit of a limp. My mother was in a nursing home because she had a genetic disease called muscular dystrophy, which meant she couldn't move anymore and she could barely even feed herself, but mentally she was totally with it. And I had a limp because of that surgery. So, but when I get to her room in a nursing home, my limp disappears and I walk perfectly normally and I work perfectly, walk perfectly normally out of her room until I shut the door behind me and then I start limping again. Now, why do you suppose I suppressed my limp? Somebody who wasn't there last night, what do you think I was doing? Anyone? No, oh, 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 oh. So, so, so you thought my mother would be afraid that I was getting muscular dystrophy. It doesn't go that far, no, so that's, that's good thought, but it's not, not that much, no, yeah. I didn't want her to worry about me, right? I didn't want her to feel my, to see my pain. But again, here's the deal. My mother, you know, being 78, had experienced a lot, you know, she'd, um, um, she survived the genocide in Eastern Europe as a Jewish mother uh, when I was one year old. Um, she survived the communist dictatorship in Hungary, the Hungarian Revolution, immigration to Canada, all the challenges of a new life and a new continent and a new culture and a new language, you know, the death of my father. She could have handled the fact that her 54-year-old son had a bit of a limp that afternoon of surgery. So. If I thought about it, I would not have done it. But the point is I didn't think about it. <clears throat> it was automatic behavior. 
It was automatic behavior. And that automatic behavior goes back to my first year of life. Because my first year was spent as an infant, as a Jewish infant, in Nazi-occupied Budapest, Hungary. So in space of three months between March and uh, June, um, the Germans uh, killed about close to half a million Jews in Hungary. Half a million people in three months. Most of them sent to Auschwitz and the other camps, including my grandparents. As a matter of fact, I was back in Hungary a month ago and um, there's a 97-year-old guy in jail in Hungary right now who was a police captain in Hungary in 1944. And this is the guy who sent my grandparents to their deaths in Auschwitz. This guy's still alive, he's 97, it's really amazing. It was sort of a disconnect. I'm here, I'm walking in the city, and somewhere in the city, this guy's under house arrest. Because at age 97, he was arrested for participating in the genocide. So my mother survived all that. But the point is that in that first year of my life, with a mother who was very stressed and very depressed and very terrorized, I learned very early that she was always so burdened that if I wanted to maintain my relationship with her, I mustn't add to her stress. So I learned as an infant to suppress my pain, not to cry too much. So I remember being a five-year-old a six or seven year old having severe ear pain due to an ear infection, a lot of pain. I'm lying there at night, not crying, just whimpering to myself, waiting till the morning to tell my parents that, you know, I ended up having surgery for my ears. But, but it was programmed into me in my first year of life that my, I must protect my mother from my pain. Now, that's what showed up 54 years later when I'm walking down the hall of that uh, nursing home. Now, of course, it's very stressful to be always suppressing your pain and not to be asking for help when you need it. That's very stressful, but that's how I lived my life because that was my programming. I wasn't born like that. No baby's born like that. Babies, when they're in pain, they scream. That's authentic. But in my case, in order to maintain or to protect the attachment relationship, I had to suppress the authenticity. So this is how it happens. It happens early in life. It happens in response to the environment. The implication is that then we become people who are always helping, who are always taking on the tasks, who are afraid of disappointing other people or our own expectations, um, who don't express our needs, who don't ask for help when we need it, and who don't say no. And that means we take on all this stuff, including the pain and trauma of others, and we make it into our own problem. Because that's what we were programmed as children, is to take on our parents' problems as our own. Just like I did, just like this young woman Rachel did, who ended up with rheumatoid arthritis. Now, how that makes us sick is what I'll tell you about next.